Association, on our upcoming gallery shows, because we have classes and workshops at the Ellis. We also own and operate a commercial gallery on Front Street, which is a run as a an underwritten by the Art Association, and it's a cooperative gallery. Um, there's information about upcoming shows. We have coastline coming up, which is the coastal printmakers, and there's always work on the wall by our 20 plus member artists. Um, anything else I should mention you can think of? Oh, there's an Arts Association member show upstairs in the library gallery, which you're invited to see on your way out. And part of the reason for this talk, which I didn't mention, is we are applying for CPC funding to do the work that our second grant um, explored and recommended on the building itself to secure the exterior against the elements and thereby preserve it into the next century. So, Wendy, do you want me to turn out lights for you or give you a little more? Do that. Yeah. <coughs> okay, I'll shut this one. I'll leave that over. <coughs> First of all, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I would like to thank Janet Cornaccio and the Situan Arts Association for inviting me to give this talk. More importantly, I want to thank them for their stewardship of the property I'm going to talk about tonight. For the last 40 years, the Situan Arts Association <coughs> has used the Bailey Ellis House for artist studios, exhibitions, and classes, and has maintained the building using very limited funds and lots of volunteer labor from its members and friends. Given the challenges of maintaining any structure more than 20 years old, much less one as elaborate as this building, the association's commitment has been extraordinary. The Bailey Ellis House is an outstanding example of 19th century residential architecture in situate. It also represents the summer resort development of the town and is associated with members of one of situate's most prominent and populous families who distinguished themselves as important Boston merchants. The intact survival of the estate's original 100 acres of land is also a highly unusual and important feature. The title of my talk comes from a line in an obituary for the second owner-occupant of the Bailey Ellis House, Joseph Tilden Bailey, who died in 1895. Joseph was a wealthy Boston merchant who summered at the property for 10 years. His younger brother, John, had assembled the 100-acre estate and built the house as a year-round country home around 1874. <clears throat> he commuted to work in Boston on the then new railroad line. Members of the Bailey family lived here for nearly 100 years before giving the property to the town of Sichuan. The pleasure of wealth seemed a good way to link the exuberant architecture of the house to the people who were fortunate, to, fortunate enough to live here and to the public that can now enjoy this estate every day. This presentation is doubtless a bit different from the SAA's usual Meet the Artist talks. <clears throat> in this case, the artwork to be discussed is a house, and its artist or creator is not known for certain, but is rumored to be Gridley James Fox Bryant, who was a cousin of Joseph and John Bailey and lived up the street. As an architect and an architectural historian, I like to think that a building's design reflects not only contemporary artistic styles, but also something about the technology, economy, and society of its time. And a home embodies even more the character and aspirations of the individuals that come to inhabit it. This photo is of Mark Twain's house in Hartford, Connecticut, which coincidentally was built in the same year as the Bailey Ellis house. And it's similar style, although a little flashier. In a nostalgic move, Twain said of this house, to us our house had a heart and a soul and eyes to see with and approvals and solicitudes and deep sympathies. It was of us and we were in its confidence and lived in its grace. So houses are alive to us and people come alive through their houses. I recently came across this striking observation. 
One very fine, if not exactly intentional purpose for historic preservation is to keep dead people alive. Through stories and images, I will try to bring part of the Bailey and Bryant families alive to, to you and show you why this house matters. There aren't a whole lot of photographs. I, I don't have a whole lot of photographs of Bailey or the Bryant family, so we're going to do some sidebars of um, stories that are associated with the house that I hope will interest and entertain you. The Bailey Ellis House stood, stands atop Booth Hill in North Situate near Gannett's Corner in an area that was developed from the 18th through the 20th centuries. So the Bailey Ellis House is the circle on the bottom left, Gannett's Corner is a larger circle on the top, and the First Baptist Church is the smaller circle on the lower right. And you'll see <coughs> um, a little later how the church was um, associated with the Bailey House. The corner is what North Hitchhood Village. I've been stuck in the history too long. <laughs> um, so the house is set back approximately one quarter mile from Country Way on approximately 100 acres of undeveloped conservation land that comprised the original estate. Built with an unobstructed view of the ocean to the north or the east, I'm not sure exactly which. Um, the house was surrounded by open pastures, orchards, and gardens, which had been replaced by thick woodland. The driveway along the south side of the house once led to a large wood frame barn which stood a short distance behind the house. The barn was destroyed by fire in 1972. And you can just barely see the cupola of the barn to the left of the house. Nobody took pictures of barns back in the olden days. So the parking is on the right side yes. of the house as you see it here. The Bailey Ellis's house, Bailey Ellis's house setting, as well as pic its picturesque roof line, board and batten siding, and multiple porches, were heavily influenced by the mid-19th century trend for romantic country estates. Several important architects wrote books extolling picturesque beauty, asymmetrical, irregular, and eclectic, and the virtues of living in harmony with the natural landscape. They provided not only philosophical treatises on the subject, but also architectural plans and elevations, cost estimates, instruction on building materials and methods, and recommendations for what furniture you should put inside. The new style was partly a reaction to the sober static cubes of the Greek revival and colonial buildings that preceded it, and partly a response to the increasing mechanization of the Industrial Revolution. It was abetted by new means of building construction, such as lighter, flexible wood frames and bandsaws that could churn out decorative wood trim, and by new means of transportation, like the railroad, that allowed businessmen to live at greater distances from their offices. I like this slide shows the importance of the view of the house across the natural landscape and the windy road that goes up to it, and I thought it was remarkably similar to the Bailey Ellis house. Mm -hmm. The following slides will show more examples of what was being promulgated for country houses. Homes would be oriented toward natural features rather than the street and approached by meandering drives that heightened the sense of arrival. So you can see here in figure one, the house that's set parallel to the street, close to it. And then figure two, which was the preferred design, was you had a curvy road, the house was far back, and you had more plantings around it. Gardens, orchards, and barns accompanied the house and sustained its occupants. So here the house is um, approached by a driveway and moves around in front, and there are orchards. Um, there's a big barn complex here, and the other house has a similar kind of setup with the uh, barn and the, the plantings that, that um, were established there for. A uh, hundred years. There's still no apple tree left, and there's currant or something like that on the grounds. That's great. 
Yeah. Well, a long time ago, someone had said there was still a mulberry tree. There were mulberry trees lining the driveways, got close to the house. And there were apple and pear trees off to the side. Architectural designs were characterized by freedom and experiment with more flowing relationships between spaces and even an interest in labor-saving features for the servants. This is a, a large house. Um, you can see this, the, the um, eclectic and picturesque design. It was kind of medieval of the house. And it was by a pond. There's even a boat there. Um, lots of porches. Um, this is a um, smaller but um, <clears throat> more strongly Gothic revival house. Um, it was in a pattern book. A, a carpenter could buy the pattern book and make up and, and build houses for for residents according to these uh, plans. It's because there weren't many uh, professional architects um, available. Um, you could uh, consult a book and get the elevations and get the floor plans. And you can see the board and batten siding, the vertical strips um, and the tall peaked roofs that are similar to the Bailey Ellis house. <clears throat> this is how the 99% in situate lived. Um, this was a more modest summer house, but you can see the steep roofs and the porch with the gingerbread decoration. And there's a hammock on the porch. And the woman is holding a bicycle, which was newly popular in the 1890s. <coughs> For all their decorative intent, careful craftsmanship was expected for these houses. The varied roofs of the Bailey Ellis House are one of its signature features and also one of the most difficult to maintain. But practical issues were considered in these romantic designs. A.J. Downing, one of the early proponents of the style, wrote in 1850, particular attention must be paid in all irregular cottages of this kind to the roofing of the valleys or the lines where the intersecting roofs meet because the water from the higher parts of the roof all finds its way to these valleys before reaching the eaves. And therefore, if these valleys are not thoroughly constructed and made perfectly tight, leaky places are certain to show themselves immediately to the great injury of the house and inconvenience of the tenants. Janet knows all about this. And this is, um, the roof drainage is one of those um, large parts of the grant that the Arts Association is now trying to to use to address uh, water problems. When, yeah. When it was initially constructed, were those issues all figured out by, by the architects of the day? Well, they had, um, they, they gave, A.J. Downing gave some advice on exactly how to build those roofs and valleys, um, but they didn't have the same materials that we have today, so now you would put rubber uh, underlayment at all the valleys to keep the water out. And then in the late 19th century, they didn't have as, uh, their impervious materials were not as good. And everything has a natural lifespan. Were um, the gutters wooden or were they like? The gutters were wooded. I think the gutters were wooden. Um, and the wooden gutters will last 100 years on a slate roof, which this might have had. Or I think Janet said it had a wood shingle roof. They'll last an awfully long time, but not quite forever, and you still have to maintain them. And um, if you don't keep up gutters in particular, they will rot, and then uh, and the water splashes everywhere and um, causes problems at the roof line, at the, um, at the ground. Um, but I think that the building has held up really well for 140 years. And so, of yeah. So well, it was not built badly. I think it was built well for its time. How um, amazing how much a house will take. <clears throat> the 
main block of the Bailey Ellis House contained a grand <coughs> entrance hall, a front parlor and back dining room, which was later known as a smoking room and as a sitting room. And these were separated by a pair of walk-through butler's pantries. There was a music room on the opposite side of the stair hall and a small library, which is now a bathroom behind the, the stair hall, behind the stair hall. Um, the original kitchen wing was turned into a formal dining room in the late 19th century. The bedrooms were upstairs. The first floor of the main house contains a variety of high style detailing. Trim is typically carved of a variety of dark woods, including black walnut, sycamore, ash, and oak, which also featured in the parquet floors. And the dining room has really nice uh, design of parquet floors, which is still visible at the perimeter of the room. Bold wood moldings surround the door and window openings, elaborate mantelpieces ornament the fireplaces, and fancy plaster medallions decorate the ceilings. You can see in this one, this is in the music room to the left of the stair. There's not only flowers, but there's produce. There's a field of corn on the left, full size. That's probably the original lighting too, isn't it? I think so. Even the door hinges are beautiful. This is the front door. So we'll move now from the design of the Bailey Ellis House to the man who may have created it, with the architect Gridley J.F. Bryant. The attribution exists without documentation, but the circumstantial evidence is worth relating based on two factors, close family and social connections, and strong stylistic similarities between the 1874 Bailey Ellis House in the 1877 renovations that Bryant made to his own colonial era house nearby. Bryant was one of New England's most esteemed architects in the mid-19th century. <clears throat> Here's what situate resident Henry Turner Bailey had to say about his cousin and friend. We remember Mr. Bryant as a man of commanding presence. He was not tall, but rather stout, with broad shoulders and a large, strongly modeled head. His habit of standing always with his hands behind, behind, his feet rather far apart, and his head thrust forward gave him a noticeable likeness to the Napoleon in, in Orchardson's well-known picture of the emperor on board the Bellerophon, a likeness of which Mr. Bryant was not unconscious. To give you an idea of his lifestyle, local historian Sally Bailey Brown, another cousin, remarked that, quote, he and his wife lived at the Hotel Von Dome, which is a fancy place in Boston's Back Bay, in winter, and Mrs. Bryant, in a $1,500 dress, danced with the Prince of Wales in the days long before he became King Edward VII of England. Bryant was the son of a prominent engineer and builder, also named Gridley Bryant, he had no middle initials, who was born and died in situate. The architect's son was known for his pioneering works in the Boston granite style. He was also, with, um, this is the State Street block in Boston, that's Faneuil, uh, Quincy Market on the left. Most, well, maybe a third of this building is still standing, the central artery viaduct cut off the right-hand part, and now the, um, the Greenway is in its place. Um, he also designed distinguished state capitals and city halls. Well, this is a detail of one of his warehouses. Um, right off Commercial Street in the North End. And you can see the granite construction that Bryant was known for. He designed city halls. This is Gloucester. Um, <coughs> courthouses and jails, schools, hospitals, churches, railroad stations, custom houses, post offices, business blocks, and the occasional private house. <coughs> this is a... Um, home up in Maine, um, which was uh, recently on the market. It's still um, very well preserved. It's painted blue, Robin's egg blue. <coughs> One historian, architectural historian, wrote that it, it has been said that downtown Boston from the 1850s to 1870s was practically a Bryant-built city. This is Boston's old city hall, which is still standing on School Street. It's been um, reused as offices and restaurants. 
1877, Bryant inherited from his parents a mid-18th century house at what is now 740 Country Way, a short distance north of the Bailey Ellis property. Gridley and his wife Louisa, who had been living in Boston, moved into the Wade Bryant house, house and according to Henry Terror Bailey, thoroughly renovated and refurnished it. Bryant's 1877 renovations included several strikingly familiar cross gables along the front, truncated end gables, and fancy moldings over the facade windows. Although the relationship is not confirmed, the Bailey Ellis House displays a sophisticated sense of proportion, massing, and detailing that evokes the great architectural conviction of Gridley Bryant. <clears throat> the Bailey and Bryant families were closely intertwined, and Gridley J.F. Bryant was said to have been a close friend of the Bailey family. When the architect fell on hard times near the end of his life, he asked his cousin Joseph Tilden Bailey, who then owned the Bailey Ellis house, to buy Bryant's home and keep it in the family. When Bailey's great-grandchildren eventually sold the Bryant house in the 1940s, they retained several household items, including a table at which John Hancock had supposedly died. So we can imagine maybe that table moved over here. The uh, spirit of John Hancock moved with it. The um, their uh, grandfather was Joseph Tilden Bailey. Um, Joseph had one child, a daughter, who was married first to a man named Ellis. And um, Mary's uh, grandchildren were Joseph Bailey Ellis, Madeline, and Catherine Ellis. So. No, I wish. <laughs> we paint on it. <laughs> Take a close look next time. So last and not least, we come to the first two owners of the Bailey Ellis house. John Wade Bailey and Joseph Tilden Bailey, two of the ten children born to Joe Bailey and Lydia Foster Wade Bailey. And I think the reason that everybody uh, is documented by the middle names is there were so many Baileys. Um, there were many John Baileys and there was more than one John W. Bailey. So um, I'll start with their full names, but I'm gonna go down to one or two, um, typically. So um, the Baileys were a large situate family, prominent in business, civic, and religious affairs, who had first arrived in situate in the late 17th century. Family histories date the construction of the house to 1874. John Bailey's wife, Priscilla Vinyl Bailey, another situate native, uh, reportedly chose the location for the house. The estate was named Elm Heights after a large American elm tree that stood on the property. It was tall enough to serve as a landmark to mariners at sea and uh, reportedly grew to 16 feet in diameter. That's hard to imagine a tree 16 feet in diameter. <clears throat> but it's long gone. And I don't think it was photographed either. Like several of his brothers, John Bailey started his career in house building. He eventually became successful in Boston as a merchant in building materials. John Bailey frequently, frequently moved back and forth between Boston and Situate in the mid-19th century until he built and occupied this house. Bailey assembled what is now the property over three decades, from the 1850s through the 1880s, and lived in the house only for its first decade, from about 1874 through 1885. By, the 18, uh, by this time, the commute to Boston was made significantly more convenient by the arrival of the railroad in Situate in 1871. The North Situate Station was located less than half a mile away. And that's the first railroad station. And that's uh, Seaburn's store, the light color building to the right. Seven. Seven. Thank you. Seven. Yes. In the 1860s and 70s, Bailey owned a business in downtown Boston that engaged in wholesale and retail sales of doors, sashes, blinds, glass, balusters, and other architectural elements. The wealth he accumulated in this part of his career is evident in the architectural quality of the Bailey Ellis House and in the size of the surrounding estate. The 
Bailey Ellis House was constructed just two years after the great fire in Boston that destroyed nearly 800 mostly commercial buildings in what is now the financial district. I think this view is looking north. There's a steeple here. I think that's Old South Church. Um, so there was acres and acres of destruction. You can imagine that John Bailey's building supply business was quite busy in a subsequent rebuilding of downtown Boston. John and Priscilla Bailey's 50th wedding anniversary, attended by nearly 200 relatives and friends, was written up in the Boston Evening Transcript in 1898, between a short account of the French president's visit to Queen Victoria and notice of an American professor's report on conditions at a Siberian prison. By the time of this celebration, however, John Bailey's fortunes had apparently declined precipitously. In 1885, he and his wife sold the Bailey Ellis house to John's older brother, Joseph, for just one dollar and other valuable considerations. It was encumbered by a mortgage of $3,000 to a local bank and one for $500 between the two brothers. After selling the house, John moved to Newton and worked at his brother's bank. Joseph Tilden Bailey rose to become an important merchant and banker in Boston in the late 19th century. He was involved in the construction, wool, and banking industries, all of which experienced huge growth in the, in the city in that era, and held, he held prominent civic positions as well. I don't have a photograph of him, unfortunately, but this is his signature. Joseph Bailey began his career in Boston in 1834, training as a carpenter. He partnered with fellow Situate native Charles E. Jenkins in the firm of Bailey and Jenkins from at least 1846 to 1865 in a business described first as house rights and later as dealing in doors, sashes, and blinds. By 1870, Bailey was partner in the firm of Bailey, Jenkins, and Garrison, wool merchants, the new partner being William Lloyd Garrison, Jr., son of the famed abolitionist, which op operated during the 1870s. Bailey's obituary describes the interesting evolution of his early career as follows. Bailey and Jenkins were very successful, and in 1849, during the gold fever, they built houses and shipped them to California. And that's a house of the era, not necessarily that Bailey built, but similar. As a large part of their return was in wool, it became necessary for them to dispose of it in some manner, and the wool merchants of Boston urged them to go into the wool business, which they afterward did. The name of the firm of Bailey and Jenkins was the synonym for fair dealing. Joseph Bailey was subsequently prominent in the local banking industry and amassed a substantial fortune. In 1868, he was elected president of the Boylston National Bank of Boston, one of the largest banks in the city at that time. Bailey served as president for more than 25 years until his death in 1894 when the bank had more than $2.8 million in assets. This is a photograph of the bank that was built while he was president. Or while he was president. And this is one of the bank notes that the, his bank issued. So at that time there were US dollars? There were. I, I'm not sure this were if these were like securities for investment, I haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. I'm not sure, I don't know that banks still do that today. But they were, it was a very common thing in, in banking in the late 19th century. I like to think that's a photograph of Bailey, but I doubt it. It's probably whoever was president at the time of the US. <clears throat> An interesting sidebar is a story of a spectacular bank robbery at the Boston, Boston, Boylston National Bank while Joseph Bailey was its president. In November of 1869, a group of thieves led by Adam Worth and Charles Bullard, also known as Piano Charlie, robbed the bank of at least $200,000, which would be worth at least $5 million today. This is how it happened. A man purporting to be a dealer in health tonics rented a room in the building next door to the bank the month before set out a large show of bottles, and with a small gang, which included a woman, 
spent a week drilling through two 18-inch thick brick walls into the safe of the Boylston National Bank. Worth and Bullard were skilled, bold, and stylish thieves. They fled to New York City and pondered what to do next. As a recent biographer wrote, they could take the cash, abandon the securities, and head west, where the frontier states offered obscurity and where the law was, at best, partially administered. But Worth and Bullard, with their taste for expensive living and sophisticated company, were hardly the stuff of which cowboys were made, and the prospect of spending their ill-gotten gains in some dusty prairie town where they might be murdered for their money was less than appealing. A more attractive alternative was to make for Europe, where extradition was unlikely and where wealthy Americans were welcomed with open arms and few questions were asked. So Worth and Bullard wound up in London and then in Paris, where they continued their careers in upscale burglary. They stole paintings and jewelry, mostly. Arthur Conan Doyle is said to have used Worth as a model for his character, Professor James Moriarty, the nemesis of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, in his uh, well-known series of books. Worth died in London and is buried there under his assumed name. Back to the Bailey family. In civic affairs, Joseph Bailey served as a trustee of the Massachusetts Charitable Mechanics Association from 1859 through 1861 and was its president from 1864 through 1866. This is the building that the association constructed while Bailey was a trustee. Bailey served as Boston City Alderman from 1859 through 1861 and was chairman of, board of the Board of Overseers of the Poor from 1866 to 1871. An obituary notes that Bailey, quote, was uniformly successful in business, and although he amassed a fortune, his manifold benevolences showed that not a small part of the pleasure of wealth for him came in sharing it with others. During his lifetime, Bailey, who was a member of a Congregationalist church in Boston, donated money in the bill for the new First Baptist Church in Situate, which was built nearby at 656 Country Way in 1869. In his will, Bailey, however, Bailey left $10,000 to the Trinitarian Congregational Society in Situate and $5,000 to the Massachusetts Homeopathic Hospital in Boston in honor of his wife. Joseph Bailey was married to Phoebe Strickland, with whom he had one daughter, Mary Wade Bailey. Not much is known of Mary, although a relative later observed that when Mary wanted a divorce from her first husband, with whom she had two children, quote, her father bought this for her as he had purchased everything else she had ever wanted. She later married a Captain Green. I don't think he was a ball of fire. During the years that they owned the Bailey Ellis house, Joseph and Phoebe's primary residence was this, this townhouse built in 1875 at 55 Commonwealth Avenue in the Back Bay neighborhood. Um, this townhouse sold earlier this year for $14 million. It's a single family house still. I looked that up because I was interested what a, what a mortgage would be on that, and it's $50,000 a month. <laughs> during the years that they, well, so this the, where they lived during the winters, the Situate Estate, which Joseph and Phoebe renamed Seaview, was used as a summer's retreat. The only known alteration they made to the Bailey Ellis house was due to Phoebe's invalid condition, which prevented her from accessing the second floor of the home. The back parlor was converted to a bedroom for her, and the small adjoining library was converted for use as her bathroom. When Joseph died in 1894, he left an estate worth more than $720,000, which would be valued at more than $18 million today, based on the consumer price index. The Bailey Ellis House property was given to his only surviving grandchild, Walter Bailey Ellis. Um, Joseph Bailey must not have had a spectacular relationship with his daughter. She inherited a house from him, but um, not much other notice uh, mentioned in his will. Uh, Walter Ellis later gave a memorial stained glass window at the First Baptist Church in memory of his grandfather, whom he called the best man that ever lived. 
So the third occupant of the Bailey Alice house, oh, one more thing, back to the churches. Bailey donated money for construction of the Baptist church building, but his name is not on this window. As the Baptist church now relates with ecumenical humor, despite his financial contributions and intimate family connections, his siblings belonged to the church and his mother was the first president of the Situate Baptist Female Mutual Religious Improvement Association. Joseph Bailey, quote, belonged to a congregational church in Boston, so that was that. <laughs> so the third occupant of the house was Walter Ellis, who was born in 1863 and died in the 1920s, and worked at least for a time at his grandfather's bank. A lot of Baileys worked for Joseph Bailey's bank. Walter was married to Harriet Kimball, with whom he had three children. The couple spent their honeymoons at the honeymoon at the Bailey Ellis house. After Joseph Bailey's death, they spent summers in the house for about 20 years. The Ellis family was significantly larger than its predecessors in the house. It included Walter and Harriet, their three children, Joseph Bailey Ellis, Catherine Ellis, and Madeline Ellis. Harriet's niece, Mary Doyle, and her mother, Joyce Kimball, and several servants and boarders. Not surprisingly, the house was significantly expanded soon after Walter acquired the property. Wings and additions were built and attached to both the existing house and the barns, and the property was renamed Ellsburg. The Ellis's reportedly employed three maids, a butler, a nurse, a gardener, and several farmhands to help tend the family and property. Several extended family members also lived in houses nearby, which Walter and Harriet provided for them. One of Walter Ellis's first alterations was attaching two older buildings on the property. These were built in the early 19th century to the east end of the Victorian house. So that's this piece here. This is the original house. Um, this is the first edition and the second edition. A small one and a half story carriage house was moved up from a field at the curve of the drive and attached to the east end of the original dining room kitchen. The middle addition was used for a kitchen on the first floor and maids rooms above. Attached beyond that was a two story half house. Harry Ellis's niece and mother occupied this addition. Walter Ellis, Walter's daughter Catherine reported that the pointed top of the house's tower was removed in one piece before she was born in 1893. Placed in the yard, the spire became, she said, one of the sources of entertainment of our childhood. Sadly, it no longer remains. The Arts Association has recently completed painting the tower in the house's original historic colors. Well, not original, but they're historic. But the roof will probably not be restored. Several changes were also made to the interior of the original house during Walter's ownership. Most significantly, the present dining room was created in the original kitchen wing. The current fireplace, shown here, occupies the location of the original kitchen stove. And this is the new kitchen stove. The Ellis's maintained the property not only as a summer home, but also as a working farm. During their ownership, the landscape featured horses, dairy cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, an ice house, and orchards, including mulberry, cherry, apple, and pear trees. A vegetable garden, flower garden, and lawns around the Bailey Ellis house were maintained by an Italian gardener who lived on the property. Um, so one thing you can tell, you can see in this picture again, is the barns. Uh, let's think about There's another slide. You can barely make out the tower is still on. The roof is still on the tower in these old photographs. Mm -hmm. Following Walter Bailey Ellis's death after 1920, Harriet and her two daughters occupied the house year-round. Oh, I skipped again. Sorry. Um, Walter and Harriet Ellis were s summer residents, but they maintained strong local connection. Two of their children, Joseph and Madeline, both with warm weather birthdays, were born in Situate. Walter donated land to the North Situate Library Association for the construction of the new public library at 701 Country Way. Harriet was active in the Library Association and left a small sum of money to it in her will. So after Walter died, Harriet wasn't much up for maintenance, and 
she and her, um, the, she made a few changes to the house, mainly taking off things that required high maintenance. The original shutters from the outside of the building and some of the eaves brackets were taken off. Upon Harriet's death in 1928, the Bailey Ellis house was left to her daughters, Catherine and Madeline, who occupied the house until their deaths in 1954 and 1961, respectively. <clears throat> As Catherine and Madeline had no heirs, the property passed to the heirs of their brother Joseph, who had lived in Pittsburgh. Joseph Ellis died in 1950, leaving his estate and trust to his wife and their three children. Wanting to keep the property intact for the benefit of the community, the children transferred the house and its 102 acres to the town of Situate in 1969. The property today is maintained as conservation land with numerous walking trails. The Bailey Ellis House and about three acres of land immediately surrounding it are operated by the Situate Arts Association. I'll close this talk about the pleasure of wealth with a reminiscence from Catherine Ellis about her childhood in the Bailey Ellis House in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This is a picture where you can see the roof this spire on the top. So Catherine wrote, we never had an inkling of what mother and dad might be planning, as we never heard any plans or discussions and were never asked to put in our two bits. Mother would simply announce at the breakfast table, today we will do this, or tomorrow you will do that. It might be merely a ride to the beach or it might be a trip to Europe and we never dreamed of doing anything else. All that was expected of me was to get on board, and I never dreamed that all my friends and relations did not lead exactly the same sort of life. I was well grown up and out in the world before it even dawned on me how very, very fortunate I have always been and still am. So, thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to Try to answer them. <laughs>